So we actually have a pointer that works today. This is good. I guess we just needed batteries. <laughs> Minor detail. All right, so we're going back to Paris, to Notre Dame. Sadly, this is the spire that, that collapsed when Notre Dame caught on fire and it's now dark and they're going to try to rebuild it for three years. But this is what it looked like prior to the time when the, the massive fire about took it out. This is what it looked like on the inside. Um, really gorgeous. Pretty amazing when you think they built it in like 1100, you know, by hand. So pretty impressive when you see that. And this was the one window that they kept showing on the, when they were trying to put the fire out. This is the side window that survived. This is Paris City Hall, so we're just continuing our tour of Paris, and there's a plaza out here where protesters always hang out. There's always protesters and people on strike. It's kind of a national pastime in France, is that you just go on strike all the time. All right, so we're going to go back and talk about IOLs, and we can't talk about IOLs without going back to Mr. Ridley. So this is Mr. Ridley's plaque in St. Thomas's Hospital in London. And so Alan Crandall and I were there for the ESRS. As you can see by our hair, this was several years ago. Although Alan's hair is always brown. I'm, I'm not making any comments, but <laughs> it's always brown. Mine has gotten a lot more gray. But in any event, we went to St. Thomas's and we asked the, the information person, we said, where's the Ridley plaque? And they said, who? And so unfortunately, Mr. Ridley, who is really the pioneer of intraocular lenses, is was completely unknown in St. Thomas's Hospital, which is where the first implant in the world was put in. And so after going down many, many hallways and back stairs and things, we finally found the Ridley plaque in, in a back hallway at St. Thomas's Hospital in London. All right, this is Mr. Ridley. When he retired, um, he liked to go fly fishing, and these are his flies that he tied himself. So. You know, you really need to understand the story of intraocular lenses. And so, legend has it that Ridley was operating with a student, and they were taking out the cataract, and then the student said, well, aren't you going to put a lens back in? And of course, you know, the, no, nobody did that back then. You took out the cataract, and then you would, um, you know, you would leave the patient with a fake expectacles. And if you've never seen a fake expectacles, you may not see people with them in the clinic. They're those huge you know, plus, plus 15 spectacles. And people could be 2020, they can be 2015 with these, yet they have a huge scotoma um, peripherally because of the way that the light rays are bent, if you can imagine. And so these poor people would experience what's called the jack-in-the-box phenomenon. So you're, you're driving down the road and, and you look out your side mirror and there's nobody there and then suddenly, poof, a car pops up out of nowhere because you've got this scotoma there. So it's very disturbing to patients. It, magnifies things about 25 percent so it's very 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 disturbing and so Ridley at the time was um, you know in, in London during the Blitz when the um, uh, Nazi planes were bombing London and the RAF fighters were going up to intercept the Nazi planes and what was happening is you know machine gun fire would hit their cockpits and the plexiglass in the cockpit would go into the, the fighter pilots eyes and so as Mr. Ridley's taking these pieces of cockpit out, he finds that, that they're completely inert. The eye is not responding to them. There's no inflammatory reaction, very inert. And it turns out serendipitously that these plexiglass cockpits, plexiglass is PMMA, polymethyl methacrylate. So Ridley finally put it together and said, hey, if we're going to put a lens back inside the eye, why don't we put a lens, you know, back in, inside in the posterior chamber where it belongs? And so he had Rayner, which is a company that's still um, in business now, make him an intraocular lens. And this is what it looked like. It was a disc, it was very thick, it was very heavy, and you would put it in the posterior chamber. 
Did they ever try using like a glass lens? Like making one out of glass? Um, they, did make, they did make glass. There was a company called Linell, which made a glass lens in the United States. There was one minor problem is that when the glass lens first came out, this invention called the YAG laser came out. And if you're yagging a capsule behind a glass lens and you hit the glass lens, it completely fractures it. Yeah, so that, that company lasted about a week after the, um, the YAG laser came out. But if you could get this into the bag, these lenses were amazing. This was a cadaver eye that came to our laboratory 30 years after a lens that was put in by Mr. Ridley. And so you can see it was, it was totally encapsulated within the capsular bag and it lasted for 30 years. Well, the problem is, is these, this is what the edge of it looked like. They weren't very, very well finished. And now surgery at this time, you have to imagine how crude the surgery was. And the surgery at this time was using loops. There were no microscopes to do this. They're using loops to do this. They're making a 180 degree incision with a graphy knife. So you poke through the limbus on one side, go all the way around to the limbus on the other side, and you basically saw the cornea in half. Then you lift it up, and you go in there and you grab the capsule and just tear it off. And then squirt some fluid in there and squirt the contents of the, of the cataract out. So you can imagine there's not a capsular axis, there's not an intact capsule in a lot of cases. And so putting these lenses in the posterior chamber, if you got it in the bag, it was fine, but Oftentimes they were just in the posterior chamber somewhere, they would dislocate, they would scrape the iris, they would cause pigment dispersion, glaucoma, all kinds of problems. And so these really did, did lead to problems when, you know, when these lenses were put in. Now because of that, the um, people in Europe, this was all going on in Europe by the way, and so I have to say our, our wonderful American Academy of Ophthalmology, poor Mr. Ridley, he came over in the mid-50s to the United States, very excited to give a talk on this wonderful invention he had. And basically, the American Academy of Ophthalmology president said, if anyone in the US puts these dangerous devices in the eye, I will personally come and testify at their malpractice trial. And so, this was the reason why the ASCRS was developed. Because the academy was against IOLs, they were against FACO, they were against these cowboys out there with these new techniques, you know, we should stick to the tried and true traditional techniques. And so this was the reason why the Inter American Intraocular Implant Society, which became the ASCRS, was developed. And so the ASCRS was a rebel society. They were out there, they were the rebels against the, you know, the establishment AAO. So all of this took place in Europe. So there were several doctors that said, hey, you know, doing these extra caps isn't working really well, we're not having good work, and about that time, a guy named Percy Amoyles from South Africa was working with a cryoprobe. And sometimes if you really look carefully at the cryoprobes you use for retina now, you look at it, it'll say Amoyles on there somewhere. And so he figured out you could take this cryoprobe and you could stick it to the lens capsule and you could break up the zonules and you could pull the whole cataract out of there which was really good at getting the cataract out of there, but there's no capsular support. So a lot of people said, hey, why don't we put an implant in the anterior chamber? And so one of Mr. Ridley's residents, uh, Mr. Peter Choice, decided, well, you know what? Since the posterior chamber lenses aren't working well, people are now doing these intracaps. Let's get a lens made of PMMA and put it in the anterior chamber. So this was Choice's first one, and, and you know, this was the time people were flying, you know, jets faster than the sound barrier, so, you know, Mach 1, Mach 2 sounded really cool, so this was the Mach 1 lens, and this was the lens he put in, and he went through several different designs, and eventually the Mach 8 was the design that stuck, and so the idea is, is it's a one-piece PMMA, it's got four foot plates which rest on the iris, and now again, we're making large wounds here. These are, these are, you know, 11 millimeter wounds that people are making. And so you're putting these in the anterior chamber. And this lens, the, the material's inert. If it was fit perfectly, it did okay. But we didn't have ultrasound then. We didn't have OCT then. Didn't have a lot of other things. And I say we, I wasn't born yet then, so 
not that old. But, so, but Crandall, you know, he was around then, so. But in any event, the problem with these is they have to be sized perfectly, and there was very imperfect ways of sizing these. So what would happen, now this was, again, this was the Mach 9. This was his, his most, most recent one. So this was the one that he did. So the problem is, is when you put these in, if they are too big, they tend to tuck the iris and oval it and scrape against the iris. If they're too small, they would move like a propeller. You could see these things, you know, you'd be trying to take these out of the eye and you'd go in with your irrigating solution and it would just go and just spin around. So this is one that's too big. And what you see is you see that it is, it is, oops, let's go back one. It is actually digging into the angle. It's causing a hyphema here and causing just chronic, chronic inflammation. And so this is a cadaver eye. Now we removed the cornea. We're looking at it anteriorly and it looks like a cat's eye. And so you can see that this, these foot plates are tucked into the iris, ovaling it, and this particular one rotated right into the peripheral iridectomy. So you'd get pupillary block with these, and so you had to do a large peripheral iridectomy. And so sometimes these would actually rotate right into the right into the peripheral iridectomy. And you see that cat's eye pupil we you have with these. You can imagine that's not real good for, for you know, not, not causing inflammation and sitting in the eye for a while. So, and this is what it looked like when it would tuck the iris. So as we're looking right here, this is a trabecular meshwork. Look at all that pigment in the meshwork. So this has disrupted the pigment. Look how thin that iris is that's tucked all the way behind the ciliary body. It's disrupted pigment, the pigment is clogging the trabecular meshwork, you're getting a pigmentary glaucoma, you're getting chronic inflammation. And look, it's tucking that iris all the way back almost to the pars plana. So the problem with these, unfortunately, they came in two sizes. You've heard the joke always, you know, too big and too small. So those were the two sizes. And so you take a caliper, that was humor, you know, humor, or, or, or humor, okay. So you would take a caliper and you'd measure the white to white and you would add one. Well, if you've ever looked at an eye, an eye under the, the slit lamp, white to white, and you can be off a millimeter on that. It's very vague where you call the white starting. And so you would end up with lots of problems with these. And the other problem is when they started making these, um, companies in the U.S. saw, hey, you know, these new implant things, these are going to be a good idea. Let's start making them. And so this was a, a ripoff of a choice lens, an unlicensed copy. And look at the edge of that. That's an EM looking at the edge. So for fun, when I was a Dave Apple fellow, we took a Coca-Cola bottle, we broke it on the curb, and we took an EM and it looked like that. So you can imagine what that's gonna do, scraping on the iris and cutting it. And so one of the first talks I gave was as a, as a um, Dave Apple fellow, I hadn't even done a residency yet. I was at the, the American Intraocular Implant meeting I was giving a talk about these horrible lenses, and unfortunately, Mr. Choice was on the panel. And so he immediately stiffened his back and he clicked his mic, and he made it very clear to me that these were unlicensed ripoff copies. These were not his lens. His lens was much more well polished than that, which was absolutely true. So I made a point to stop calling these choice, you know, choice type lenses, because he was very upset about that. All right, so what could you do to, to take care of that problem? And so, again, this is now in the early 70s. People in the U.S., companies are starting to say, hey, these, we're onto something. These implants are, are going to be the future, so let's start designing them. And so what was happening is people were designing IOLs on napkins at cocktail parties. And so they'd be sitting down with an IOL company, and they'd say, hey, I've got an idea. They would draw it out, and they would name it after themselves. So this was the Azar lens. And so you have to put numbers on a lens. It sounds pretty cool. So this was called the 91Z, because Z sounds cool. So this was 91Z. And at one time, this was the largest selling lens in the US. And what it has is it's got a PMMA optic, but it's got these haptics made out of proline, polypropylene. And the advantage of these is they have loops in them. And so if you put them in, instead of having these flat foot plates, you know, digging in, these loops supposedly would fit right into the area of the angle, and these would be easier to put in and that they would be better tolerated. And indeed, for about the first year and a half, these things did pretty well. 
know, they, they did pretty well when they were put into the ice. This was the Azar 91Z. At and this point, sorry, at this point, had our FACO come out? No. At this point, people are doing manual extra caps. Man, or intracaps, actually. At this point, the average American surgeon was still doing an intracap with a cryoprobe. So no capsular bag intact. So Lysky from New Orleans decided he's going to design one. The difference is Lysky made one that was square. But same idea. Proline haptics, PMMA optic, and these were called closed loop lenses. And again, people came up with all kinds of ideas. This was one that was made strictly out of PMMA. This was PMMA, but again, it didn't have that solid foot plate. It had this open loop that was right here. And lastly, this lens drove us crazy here. This was the stable flex. This was a lens that people, yes? I don't understand the timing because I thought FICO comes out in the 60s and now we're in the 60s. Kalman invents FACO in the 60s. FACO doesn't really become the primary mode of surgery in the United States until mid to late 80s. Okay. Yeah, so it's really not widely used. Again, because the academy said it's, it's, you know, it's crazy. It's, it's cowboys out there doing it. You don't need to do it. Extra cap is fine. So this was the stable flex lens. And the idea is you make these open loops and they don't close them off completely. They open a little bit, which makes it more flexible. And there was a surgeon in town here who put in like hundreds of these. And the problem is, is these loops would get totally fibrosed into the angle and into the iris. And so you would have to cut this in like eight different places to take these damn things out of there. So these were, these were just a nightmare. And what would they cause? Basically what would happen is, is these closed loop lenses would dig into the iris. So these little round loops would dig into the iris and they would cause chronic UGG syndrome. Hopefully you guys have heard the term UGG, uveitis, glaucoma, hyphema, UGG. And UGG was, was first named by a guy, Ellingson, in South Dakota, who saw these people with these old choice lenses that would get this inflammation, so they called it the UGG syndrome. So this is a different closed loop. This was the Hesburgh lens. This one looked like a, a T that came out here. And this you can see, corneal edema, chronic inflammation, high pressure, inflamed eye, UGG syndrome. So these loops would dig into the iris. They would cause chronic uveitis. But again, they, they would cause the angle to close off and cause glaucoma. <coughs> this is a cornea of a patient with, with a 9-1-Z lens. And so the first paper I ever wrote as a Dave Apple Fellow, we had 14 corneas from patients with 9-1-Z lenses, that first one I showed you that had corneal edema, bullous keratopathy. And the guys in town here who were putting them in were going around saying that this is the greatest thing ever. I've put hundreds of these in and never had any problems. Well, and we say it to this day. Well, of course you don't have problems because when there's a complication, you don't see them. They go to the university. So it's the same thing now with multifocals. People say, I put them in. I never take them out. Well, of course you don't because they come up here with the complication and Alan and I take them out. So it was the same idea back then. And so this guy in town was touting this lens as, as a wonderful lens, and I was giving talks saying, well, wait a minute, this has problems. This is maybe not the best design. And so in Dave Apple's lab, we were looking at IOL complications, and we found that these closed-loop anterior chamber lenses cause bullous keratopathy. So it's a cornea that's edematous. And this is a cadaver eye. Again, we've removed the cornea so we could see it because the cornea is cloudy. Look at these loops. They're literally into a tunnel almost in the angle that's fibrosed over. And so you can imagine what that would do in terms of glaucoma, but again, that would scrape on the iris and cause chronic UGG syndrome. This is what it looked like. This is the angle. This is the iris posterior surface. And look, this loop digs all the way to the root of the iris. So it completely buries itself in there. So these closed loop lenses, even though they look good for a year, year and a half, we're probably not going to be the answer. Were those and, loops, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Were those loops like springy or are they like pretty stiff? Well, the idea was is that they would give a little bit. But one of the problems is if they're closed loop, like the one we showed you previously, if you compress them, 
the optic tended to vault because they were closed loop. And so if a person would rub their eye, and we did tests in the lab where we, we would squeeze them with a little squeeze gauge, and what would happen is the optic would vault forward. And so you can imagine that vaulting forward and literally bouncing on the cornea when someone would rub the eye. And so like, think of like leaf springs on a big truck that you see driving around, you know, it, it, it would vault forward when you would do that. So the idea is, is that the, they tried to make these open loops with the idea is that it wouldn't vault as much. But the problem is these things would just get fibrosed into the angle. And you can see they did two giant peripheral iridectomies, and, and these were just, just hell to get out. This was an interesting uh, idea. This was a doctor in Washington, D.C. who said, well, if these closed loops are bad, let's make open loops. And so he put these three broad loops. It looks like a propeller on an airplane. One, two, and you can barely see the third one up here. And so the problem is these would literally close off the angle about two thirds of the angle. So these patients would get a severe glaucoma. And so, you know, and again, there was a guy in town who put tons of these in. And, and so we had lots and lots of patients who would come in with these with severe glaucoma. And, you know, bottom line is these lenses would give you corneal edema, they give you chronic glaucoma, they give you chronic UGG syndrome. And so when I first was a fellow in 1984, the most common indication for cornea transplants in the United States was pseudophagic bullous keratopathy. And so it just shot way up. So you're getting tons of cornea transplants because of these lenses. There you see a cornea with bullous edema there, bullous keratopathy. What else would these cause? All right, anybody? What are we looking at right here? CME. CME, exactly. So what part of the retina are we in? The outer plexus only. But um, where in the, the scope of the retina? Oh. We're in the macula because you see the ganglion cells are more than one cell layer thick, and sure enough, here in the outer plexiform layer, what do we call that layer that's, that's right near the fovea? Henley's layer, and so you actually see exudate cystoid macular edema from the chronic inflammation from the UGG syndrome. So you could get CME from UGG syndrome, so that we call that UGG plus, UGG plus CME. So finally, Kelman, the same Kelman who invented the ultrasound, said, you know what, if these closed loop IOLs are really causing this UGG syndrome and causing problems, why don't we make an open loop IOL? Except let's not make it really stiff and bulky like the you know, choice lenses were. Let's make one that's more open. So his first design was a tripod. And we joked about it. We called this the pregnant seven. And so, think about it. It's a seven and it's pregnant. So the pregnant seven, we called it that. And so, Kelman had an argument and he said, you shouldn't have four point fixation in the angle because if you were in a, in a bar and you have a, a stool with four legs on it, the floor's uneven, it'll wobble. But if you have a three legged stool, it won't. That was his argument. He used to go around and give lectures saying that. So he came up with this tripod design, the pregnant seven. Well. The problem is, is this thing was really stiff and this would poke into the iris. And I'll give it to Kelman. He would figure things out pretty quickly. So people are telling him, no, no, that's too stiff. That doesn't work. So he changed it. So he called this the OmniFit lens. And so he made it thinner, still made of PMMA, thinner haptics, so they'd be a little bit more flexible. But again, the tripod design just didn't work. And so Again, Kelman being a bright guy said, all right, he chucked the three-legged stool out the window and he went to the Kelman multiflex lens. Does this look familiar? I don't know if you guys ever see anterior chamber IOLs now, but this is the lens we use now to this day, 35 years later. So this design stuck. So this is PMMA, it's open loop. And so when we would test these in the lab, if you squeeze those haptics, the haptics take the squeezing without vaulting the optic. So if you rub the eye and those squeeze, 
they're cantilevered, and so they would take the pressure on there, but without vaulting the optic forward. So big advantage there. Secondly, these foot plates, you notice that they go concave in instead of convex out. And so the idea is, is they just kind of touch the angle in two places so they don't completely occlude the angle. And because these foot plates are a little more oval rather than round and a little flatter, they don't get the tunnel growing over them of fibrous tissue. So this really was the, um, you know, the answer to anterior chamber IOLs, and indeed, 35 years later, this is still the IOL that we use now. And so this should look familiar to you guys. This is the old Apple core, and, and so Dave Apple worked by taking his dictaphone, laying out a bunch of pictures on here, and then having his, his fellows and students sit around and run around and order the pictures and do, you know, you see we've all got these black and white EM pictures and all that, so I don't know who this swarmy Greek guy with the mustache is. And these were another couple, this was another fellow, these guys were a couple students, and so um, this is how we would write papers. And so the lab was churning out papers like every month. And so it was, it was an incredibly exciting time to be a fellow because this is un charted territory. No one was looking at IOL complications. And you see we had these folders and all these EM pictures crammed in them. So this is the so-called Apple core. And he loved it because he's German. So we even had shirts made up, you know, K-O-R-P-S, the Apple core. Get it? You know? Okay. Mm -hmm. We had shirts made up with the Apple from Apple computers with a little bite taken out of it. So the Apple core. All right. So also in Europe, at the same time, people were looking at, okay, anterior chamber IOLs, maybe they're not the best place to do it. Why don't we take an IOL and clip it to the iris? And so there were a couple of people who did it. Jan Wurst, there, there was, you know, Wurst did it, and Binkhorst, a couple of guys in, in Holland and Belgium decided they were going to do it. And so this one, I, I'm sorry, it's not a great drawing, but these would have... Uh, these loops, two on each side, one would go behind the iris, one would go in front of the iris. It would literally clip it to the iris. And so four loop lens would clip it to the iris. And finally, what Worst said, okay, these clip lenses, if you dilate the pupil widely to look at their peripheral retina, they'd fall out. So he said, we can't have that. So why don't we make a hole here and suture this thing to the iris, but still keep the clips posteriorly to hold it in place. And he even would put a little peg on here to hold it. And so we used to joke, because this truly was the worst lens we'd ever seen in the lab. And so this was, but his name was John Worst. So this was the, the worst lens. Now the problem is, is these loops were all made out of proline, polypropylene. If you put proline into uveal tissue, like the iris, like the angle, it would start to hydrolyze and you'd get these mud flap cracks on it. And so this is the so-called cracking. Now, that's even pertinent to this day because if you're suturing an IOL to the iris now, posterior chamber lens to the iris, what do you use? You use proline suture. So if you use a 10 proline and it starts to degrade like that, it can spontaneously just disintegrate and break. And so always use 9-O-Proline, don't use 10 proline 9 even though it doesn't seem like it's much bigger, it's about 40% stronger. And so this is what proline sutures do also. This was a proline haptic, and proline would degrade in uveal tissue. So somebody said, well, proline degrades, let's make these out of metal. So they made them out of titanium. Well, first off, titanium is really expensive. Secondly, titanium you can't polish. Thirdly, titanium is really heavy. And so these lenses would literally drop into the vitreous and would dislocate and would cause huge problems with UGG. So again, titanium didn't last long. The reason I'm showing you all these is every once in a while I'll get a resident will pop up and say, hey, I've got a great idea for an IOL. Why don't you do this? And my answer is, well, yeah, we did that. 30 years ago, it didn't work. And so this was actually metal, and this was titanium. So they said, oh, titanium's in there, this would be great, but it didn't work. 
Was it easy just to experiment on patients with all these different IOLs? <laughs> oh yeah, these were, this was the wild days. These were the cowboy days. These are people who are putting them in left and right. The FDA did not have a, um, you know, a, a device section yet. Well, I guess this is a good time to, to, to tell the story. Since you brought it up, we'll tell you the story. So at this time, this is now the early 80s, people are starting to put in a lot of IOLs. And again, the Academy is grumbling. These are crazy ideas. This is blinding people. So Ralph Nader, you've heard of Ralph Nader, right? <laughs> Nader's Raiders. So Ralph Nader decided these things are blinding people. And so Nader's Raiders looked into this and said, we've got to you know, shut these things down. These are dangerous. And, and so the FDA said, my God, we really should, should look into this. And so they had congressional hearings. And fortuitously, Dick Kratz, who sadly just passed away in, in Southern California, great guy, he did a cataract surgery on an actor who at that time was the lead actor in the number one show in America. So at that time, there was a TV show called Marcus Welby, MD. And Robert Young was the actor, and he was America's dad. He had been in a show, Father Knows Best, and he was this, this well-known actor. And this was the number one show in America, and he was a private practitioner who would see, you know, two patients a day and go to their houses and take care of them and go to the hospital and was the doctor everyone wanted to be. Well, so he was the number one actor, the number one show in America. He had cataracts, and Dick Kratz took out his cataract, put in an IOL, and Robert Young came and testified in the House Committee when this was going on and said, this saved my career, this saved my life, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. And because he was the most famous man in America, he had all this publicity going on. And so as a result, they didn't shut down IOLs, but the FDA set up a product division, which it hadn't had before. And they set up a study and so at this time, all IOLs were part of an FDA study. And so when you were putting in IOLs, you had to fill out an IOL investigator form for every single company. You know, at this time, there were like 14 companies. And so when you're putting these in, you had to fill them all out, and then the results had to be reported to the FDA. But bottom line is, we were allowed to keep IOLs, and, and the research went on. And all because Dick Kratz operated on a famous actor. So, sorry, but it's always an interesting story. This is stories today anyway, so. All right, so what would happen when you put these in? This was a worst lens, and the suture here broke, and look at that iris. It's irregular, there's synechia, the pigment's all blotchy, there's a big PI here, and so these would again cause UGG syndrome and again cause corneal edema just from the chronic inflammation. And so these, these cause problems also. And if you did, this is an EM now of one of these lenses that was removed and this is actually part of the iris just completely stuck to it. And so taking these out again was really hell without disturbing the iris. So very, very difficult. So at this time, people were starting to do a magical kind of surgery called an extra cap where you were leaving the capsular bag intact. And so as a result, they started putting loops here that would fit in front of the lens capsule. The idea was that you, this would have capsular support on it. Now, what was funny is, is as these companies were doing these, these were the ads that were appearing in the journals. So this is Copeland. And Copeland would have wishing you happy holidays. These are the little Copeland elves making these Copeland IOLs. And so, these guys came up with an idea. Why don't we make an IOL that you put two loops behind the iris, two loops in front of it, and it holds it in place. So this was the Copeland lens. And it would give you a square pupil. So here's the loop in front of the iris. Here's the loop behind the iris. Here's pigmented giant cells all over the IOL. Here's synechia forming here. So again, these didn't work really well, but the cool thing is you got a square pupil, so you could always recognize these. You'd go, oh, Copeland lens. Now the problem with a lot of these is if you dilated the eye to try to look at the peripheral retina, sometimes these would dislocate. So, so that was an issue with a lot of these iris fixated lenses. Retina guys did not like these. And again, this is a Copeland lens. You can barely see it because of the severe corneal edema. This is a patient with, with corneal edema. This was my favorite ad. 
This was from one of the companies. I loved it. I made a copy of this. Proven safe and effective, <laughs> discontinued. So, you know, they wouldn't come out and say, yeah, this was bad, we're pulling it off. They would just, they'd have this whole page of all their IOLs, you know, proven safe and effective. Oh, but by the way, we discontinued it. So these, these would eventually all be discontinued. All right. At this time, again, people were starting to now do not only extra caps, but FACO was starting to come into practice. And so as a result, because of that, we now had the abilities to leave the lens capsule intact. Now also people started using microscopes to do surgery, so you could see much better what you were doing. And so as a result, you have an intact posterior capsule. So finally, someone said, hey, wait a minute, maybe Ridley was right. We have an intact capsule, why don't we put an implant in the posterior chamber where it should go? Away from the cornea, away from the iris, and so a guy named Shearing in Las Vegas, interesting, these, these are names you don't even hear of now because they, they thought of one brilliant idea and that's what they did. And so Shearing said, why don't we put some little J haptics on this round optic made of PMMA and put it in the posterior chamber, you know, where, where it should be. And so as soon as this came out, ophthalmologists are a very innovative bunch. Immediately they said, wow, that's a great idea. And so things just exploded right at that point. And so a guy named Simcoe in Oklahoma said, hey, those little J loops are, are pretty hard and pretty narrow. They look like an umbrella stand. Why don't we make ones that fit better? So he made this broad C loop. This was the Simcoe loop. The idea was is that this would fit into the capsule or bag better and, and would fill the bag completely. Now, you ask, what are these things? Those are positioning holes. So this is before we had OVDs. So you would put these in and, and the chamber would be collapsing and you'd have to put little hooks in there and try to maneuver these. You couldn't see what you were doing. Some people put air in there to try to keep the chamber formed. And so you have no idea what a great invention Helon was. So Helon was the first OVD, hyaluronic acid. And so Helon was like a miracle because you could keep the chamber formed and you could maneuver inside the eye. Well, when Helon first came out, it was expensive. So at our VA in Chicago, you could only use the Helon for complex cases. And so it was almost like there was a drum roll. You'd say, get the Helon. And so they would go to the back to the secret refrigerator and they'd put it on a golden pillow and you know, they'd bring it out to you, the Helon. You know? And so you would use it. But it was a wonderful invention because you could maneuver inside the eye without causing damage. But before we had that, these IOLs all had these big positioning holes in it. Look, there's pigment stuck to it. So you can imagine these positioning holes scraping on the iris. So Bob Sinsky, and again, you guys have heard the Sinsky hook. He just passed away recently. Sinsky said, well, you know what? The, the J loop is a good idea, but, but it's too stiff and too straight. So let's modify it. So he did a modified J loop where he put a little bit of a bend to it here Bentute are still a positioning hole. Interestingly, IOLab was the first big manufacturer in the U.S. They put their name on the IOL. So it had this name. So this is great. This is a great nidus for giant cells to attach. And they would put the power on there, too. So you can see that when you looked in there. So this was the, the Sinsky modified J loop. And this was when I was training in the mid 80s. This was the most popular lens in America. This was the lens. And so as a matter of fact, we would sit around as residents and say, wow, Look how far we've come. We're doing extra caps. We're putting these IOLs in. We're cutting the sutures at eight weeks. Patients are, you know, 20, 25. This is great. This will never get better than this. How, how could surgery get any better than this? So you guys are laughing at this now, you know. we got clear corneal incisions and foldable IOLs, and people can see the next day, and FACO. And so this was great. This was a huge leap forward at the time. Now, there was an argument then about where to put the IOL. Do you put it in the ciliary sulcus in front of the bag, or do you put it inside the bag? And so there's a big argument, and the guys at uh, Johns Hopkins were arguing that you should put it in the sulcus, that would be better. So again, we looked at a ton of cadaver eyes. We said, no, no, sulcus is a really bad idea. You should put it in the bag where it is sequestered from uveal tissue. And obviously, where do you put it now? In the bag. You don't put it in the sulcus anymore. 
And this is a problem if you put it in the sulcus. This is a cadaver eye. We're looking at it from behind, from the Apple view. This is where the haptics were. You can see where that haptic in the sulcus scraped on that posterior iris and scraped off all that pigment. So definitely uh, put it in the bag, don't put it in the sulcus. So this is what it looks like in the sulcus. Here's the iris. This is a big summering's ring because you've got nothing in the bag to prevent it. This is the loop digging into the root of the ciliary body all the way back behind the iris, almost to the greater iris circle. So that's an IOL loop. And you see there's sneakia here where this was pushing it forward. The iris is stuck and the mesh work's completely blocked off here. And here's that haptic way back there. So that's what would happen if you put them in the ciliary sulcus. And so if you put them in the bag, this was again, mid eighties now, if you look, here's a, a modified J-loop IOL sitting in the capsular bag. Look at that, it's beautiful. There's no inflammation, there's no scraping of pigment. It's situated inside the bag. That is the ultimate. Put that lens in the bag and that's the ultimate. This is what it looks like. Here's the iris, here's the capsular bag, here's the ciliary body, look at that, nicely protected by the capsular bag sitting behind the iris. And so this is what, um, you know, what they look like and you can see why the results are better when you put them in the bag. Now at that time, people were saying, okay, these are fine, but what else can we do here? And so Iowa manufacturing got better and so this is a one piece now PMMA, and, and they got a computer lathe that would cut this. You know, prior to this time, you would have an IOL and you'd punch it out of the block with a punch machine and then someone would hand polish it. And so now they came up with a computer lathe that would cut an IOL out of a block of PMMA and you would tumble polish it. Look at the edge of that. It's beautiful. And so they still do it to this day. It's almost like, did you ever polish rocks when you were a kid? Or you know, you do that, so what you do, you put them into this thing and there'd be a bunch of little beads in there and some polishing solution and you'd spin it for like seven days and it would ultra polish it. And so that's still what they do with IOL. So you put some little beads in there and some polishing compound and you tumble polish it and you get this gorgeous finish. And so these IOLs were beautifully finished. Now, we can't talk about IOLs without talking about how cataract surgery evolved, and this is where your question was, was pertinent. So the way that, that surgery was done in the 70s and, and even into the early 80s is you would make an 11 millimeter incision, you'd pre-place a lot of sutures because you didn't want the whole eye to expulse just in case it did, you could close it. So then you'd lift the cornea up. Imagine what that's doing to endothelial cells. We didn't have endothelial counters yet then, but imagine what that's doing to endothelial cells. And then you'd go in there with a cryoprobe and you'd stick the cryoprobe to the capsular bag. Now, by this time, we wouldn't just break the zonules. We had alpha chymotrypsin, so you'd squirt alpha chymotrypsin in there, it would dissolve the zonules. And then about a minute later, you'd go back in with the cryoprobe, you'd stick it to the capsular bag, and boy, you know, you just pop that thing right out. And so you'd get that huge lens out whole, capsular bag and all. But again, no lens capsule, so the capsule bag is not intact. So a big advance was when we started doing extra caps. And basically you'd make a bunch of little punctures like a stamp punctures into a capsule, we'd call it a canopy capsulotomy, and you'd, you'd push on that and get the edge of the haptic to come, edge of, sorry, the, um, the nucleus to come up, and you'd slip a little loop underneath it and you'd pull the nucleus out. And so this was called an extra cap. And then you'd go in there with a manual Simcoe unit and you'd suck out the cortex and then you'd put an IOL in the, in the bag. Well, you can imagine what a great advance FACO was. And again, even though Kalman was playing with, with FACO in the, in the 60s when he was doing this, it really didn't take off in the US until the mid 80s. And so as, as FACO took off, the idea is, hey, we can make a three millimeter incision and take out this cataract. And so we were still doing little scleral tunnels. We weren't doing clear corneal incisions yet. And we were coming up with ways to do that. The second invention that was really good is in about 84, 
a guy named Thomas Neuhan in, in Germany and, and a guy in, the, in Canada um, came up with an idea, gimbal, to do a circular capsulotomy. So again, at that time we were using a cystitome, we were making a bunch of punctures in the capsule so that capsule would not be completely intact. Well, they came up with the idea, why don't we make a circular tear? And that was a great invention. And so that's again, we're doing that now. We ensure that that capsule is totally intact. We can put the implant in the bag. The problem is, is that you had to make the incision bigger to put in an IOL. You know, we didn't have foldable IOLs then. And so you would make this three plane incision, you'd go through the sclera, then you'd tunnel forward, and then you'd enter the cornea and do it that way. But as foldable IOLs, got invented and people started using foldable IOLs, then we could proceed to a clear corneal incision. So that was a great advantage because you didn't have to use a retrobulbar block. You didn't have to operate superiorly. You could sit temporally where you had better exposure and you can make a clear corneal incision that you did not have to stitch. So the scleral tunnels would always be superiorly? Yeah, the, the scleral tunnels would be superiorly. You, you know, you, you wanted to have them covered by the lid and you put lots of stitches in there. So you really wanted the patient not to be bothered so much by them. So you did it all superiorly. So if you're sitting superiorly when you did the surgery, you take a suture and you put it through the superior rectus muscle and then you pull it up and you pin it to the drapes and that would turn the eye down. So imagine you get a terrible red reflex with that, but that gave you exposure to work. So when we went, corn when we went temporally, you had easier access to the eye, you had better red reflex, and you could now do a clear corneal incision. So again, technology would go lockstep. And of course, this was only made possible by the invention of foldable IOLs. Do you do tunnels now when they're smaller? Can you do them temporarily? You can do them temporarily now because they're smaller, a lot smaller, and you don't stitch them now. We're making these big smile incisions now that you don't have to suture, and so those, those are tolerated better temporarily. So technology in removing a cataract and technology in IOLs went lockstep. And so when people jumped to FACO, you know, when you were doing extra caps, the wound is 11 millimeters, there's no need to have a foldable IOL. But as soon as people started saying, hey, this FACO, we can remove a cataract from a smaller incision, why should we open it up to put in an implant? And so that is what pushed IOL companies to make foldable IOLs. And so again, the technology would change, it would force other technological changes, and so they would go in lockstep. And of course, that led to the development of foldable lenses. So this was the first foldable lens. This was a silicone lens, it was a plate lens, but it rolled up like a taco. So Tom Mazzocco is the guy who invented this, so they called it the Mazzocco taco. So it would, it would be like a soft shell taco. You'd put it in there, it would unfold, it was made of silicone. Well, silicone was maybe not the best material, and this is what it looked like. This was a silicone plate lens. And so people started saying, hey, there's better material, and the material was hydrophobic acrylic, which is what we're, you know, use now in the majority of IOLs in the U.S. at least. And so the first lenses, the hydrophobic acrylic, you would fold them up in half, and you put them in. Now, other companies then started jumping in. This was Star's lens. They looked at different materials. This is now made of PVDF, a whole different material than proline, more resistant to degradation. And even now hydrophilic acrylic lenses started coming out. And so this was a hydrophilic acrylic lens that had grafted haptics on it. So the idea is there's more than one way of getting a foldable IOL into the capsular bag that still centers well in the bag. And then finally, of course, this is the Alcon Acrosoft. And you know, this was the, again, the ultimate lens. It would have good, um, you know, low YAG rates. It had a sharp edge on it. It would limit PCO. It was thin. It didn't have a bulky, you know, bulky mass to it. And so, you know, again, this was, this was the material that the Alcon settled on. And now, of course, we've got the one piece with haptic IOLs, but it's still this hydrophobic acrylic material. And I stopped there because, you know, you guys are going to learn all about IOLs now that we're using at the moment. This is a Notre Dame. This is a group. Now, why Teske is, is, at a ret is at a cornea meeting? I have no idea because it was in Paris. And so, 
he signed up for the meeting and came and hanged out, hung out for three days. But in any event, this is our this is our little group here. Liliana Werner, who lived in Paris for seven years, gave us the grand tour of Paris, and this is the bridge across the Seine where Notre Dame is. And so this is Paris. All right. So next week we get back to Path. Okay, I believe it's glaucoma. Look and see. I think it's glaucoma. Yes, that's correct. Okay, so read glaucoma, because next week you guys are going to talk, not me, okay? All right, questions. We've got four minutes. Questions about IOLs or cataract development. Nope. All right, very good.